The Goal, written by Eliyahu Goldratt, published by North River Press Books in 1984. This is a summary of the most important points explained in the book. What is the definition of productivity? Well, I suppose that means I'm achieving something. However, you are achieving something in terms of what? In terms of goals. And thus, every action that brings a company closer to its goal is productive, whereas every action that does not bring the company closer to its goal is not productive. Therefore, productivity is meaningless unless you know your end goal. There is only one goal, regardless of the business. The purpose of any business is to make money. All other aspects of a business's operation that are crucial to its success serve solely to make money. They are not the goal, but rather the means to achieve it. The reasoning behind this argument is simple. If a business is not making money, it ceases to exist. If the goal is to make money, then any action that moves us closer to making money is productive, whereas any action that moves us further away from making money is non-productive. How do we determine if we are make money? How many measurements are required to determine whether or not we are making money? Something that indicates your earnings in dollars, yen, or whatever currency. Conventional metrics include net profit, relative metrics such as return on investment, and cash flow as a third metric. To state the goal conventionally, it should be to generate income by increasing net profit, return on investment, and cash flow simultaneously. These conventional measurements do not lend themselves particularly well to the day-to-day -day operations of a business. You need metrics that perfectly express the goal of making money while also allowing you to develop operational rules for running your business. They include throughput, inventory, and operational expense. Throughput refers to the rate at which a system generates revenue through sales. Inventory represents the total amount of funds invested in the purchase of items for sale. Operational expense is the total amount spent by the system to convert inventory to throughput. These measurements encompass everything you manage within your business. Now you must express the goal in terms of these metrics. Please keep in mind that we are always discussing the business as a whole and never a specific department. Clearly, every company would like to increase its throughput while decreasing its inventory and operational expenses, and ideally, they should all occur simultaneously. Therefore, the goal can be expressed as follows, increase throughput while simultaneously decreasing inventory and operational expenses. Throughput is the amount of money entering the system. Inventory is the amount of money currently within the system, and operational expense is the amount of money required to generate throughput. One measurement for incoming monies, one for monies still within the institution, and one for monies leaving the institution. For instance, all employee time, whether direct or indirect, idle or operating, etc., is an operational expense. The machine's depreciation is an operational expense, while any portion of the initial investment that remains and could be sold is inventory. Any money we've lost is considered an operational expense, while any investment we can sell is considered inventory. Consequently, the carrying cost of inventory must be categorized as an operating expense. If knowledge is what enables a new manufacturing process, which helps convert inventory into throughput, then knowledge is an operational expense. If we intend to sell the knowledge, such as with a patent or a technology license, it is inventory. A conventional balanced business is defined as one in which the capacity of each and every resource precisely matches the market demand. This is an error of reasoning. After all this time and effort, no one has ever managed to run a conventional balanced business. The objective of such a business is to improve resources in isolation. When the capacity of each resource is trimmed precisely to meet marketing demands, throughput decreases while inventory levels skyrocket. This is a non-productive activity because it is not in line with the objective to reduce operational expenses and inventory while simultaneously increasing throughput. The combination of two phenomena that occur in every business process, a conventional balanced business is not possible due to dependent events and statistical fluctuations. A dependent event is an occurrence or series of occurrences that must occur before another can commence. Statistical fluctuations are caused by information that varies from instance to instance and cannot be precisely predicted. It is the combined effect of the two that renders a conventional balanced business impossible. We would like to believe that fluctuations will average out over time. What is occurring is not a smoothing out of fluctuations, but rather an accumulation of them. And the majority of the time it is a buildup of negative fluctuations because dependence limits the opportunities for positive fluctuations. Never can dependent events compensate for below average outcomes of the preceding event.
these below average fluctuations accumulate and reach the end of the process. The throughput rate is reduced due to the accumulation of negative fluctuations. This causes the process to generate more work in progress, which increases inventory. The increase in inventory results in an increase in carrying costs, which raises operational expenses. Consider an event with a processing capacity of 10 items to illustrate. If the fluctuation results in 5 items, the event can process them and pass the processed items to a second event that can handle 15 items, but will only process 5 items now. However, if the fluctuation causes the first event to receive 15 items, it will only be able to process 10 and pass the 10 processed items to the second event, which will also only process 10 items. We would have intuitively assumed that the 15 items would offset the first 5 items, resulting in a throughput of 20 items. But this is not the case. Due to the fact that the first event can only process a total of 10 items, the number of items processed is 15. In this manner, negative fluctuations within the system accumulate. The objective is to optimize the business system by balancing the flow of work with market demand, not resource capacity. To optimize the system as a whole, some resources must have greater capacity than others. Due to dependent events and statistical fluctuations, the resources at the end of the line should have more than those at the beginning of the line, and in some cases, significantly more. Therefore, it is necessary to differentiate between two types of business resources. A bottleneck resource is distinguished from a non-bottleneck resource. Any resource whose capacity is equal to or less than the demand placed upon it is a bottleneck. Any resource whose capacity is greater than its demand is not a bottleneck. In the previous example, when the first event received 15 items to process, it became a bottleneck, whereas the second event was not a bottleneck. The business's effective capacity is determined by the bottleneck resource. To make the workflow equal to market demand means to make the workflow through the bottleneck resource equal to market demand. Therefore, the bottleneck resource can be utilized to regulate the system's flow into the market. Again, the non-bottleneck does not determine throughput, even if it operates around the clock. Whenever it is possible to activate non-bottleneck above the bottleneck level, doing so results in excess inventory, but not increased throughput. The measurements are meaningless if they are not based on the system's constraints. An hour lost due to a bottleneck is an hour lost by the system as a whole. A saved hour at a non-bottleneck is an illusion. To determine the bottleneck, one can calculate the hours required from each work center. A work center is any collection of identical resources. In manufacturing, a work center is comprised of 10 welders with the same skills. After calculating the number of hours a work center requires, the hours can be divided by the number of resources it contains. This will reveal the relative effort per resource and serve as a comparison standard. In addition, a bottleneck will be distinguished by the presence of a massive stack of work in process in front of it. To increase the capacity of the business, only the bottlenecks must be expanded. Utilize additional resources to alleviate some of the bottleneck's burden. To maintain the flow, it is necessary to find sufficient capacity for the bottlenecks to become more proportional to demand. Then, restrict bottlenecks to only contributing to the current throughput, and not for nine months from now. When it is known when the bottleneck component will reach the final assembly, the release of non-bottleneck resources material can be calculated backwards. As the capacity of a bottleneck reaches parity with demand, the system will experience new bottlenecks. It will appear as if bottlenecks are dispersed throughout the system. Increasing the productivity of the bottleneck will increase demand on the other work centers. If the demand for an additional work center exceeds 100%, then we have created a new bottleneck. From start to finish, the duration of a business process can be broken down into four distinct components. The first is setup time, which refers to the time a part spends waiting for a resource while that resource prepares to work on the part. In this context, a part is a subset of a business request that has been subdivided into multiple parts so that different resources can carry out the work. Process time is the amount of time a part spends being transformed into a form with greater value. The third element is queue time, which is the amount of time a part waits in line for a resource while that resource is occupied with something else. Wait time is the amount of time a part must wait for another part to become available in order for them to be reassembled. Setup and processing time represent a small portion of the total duration. Frequently, the majority of the total time is consumed by waiting and queuing. For parts experiencing bottlenecks, queue time dominates, whereas wait time dominates for non-bottlenecks. Therefore, bottlenecks determine total time, 
which implies that bottlenecks also determine inventory and throughput. To achieve continuous improvement of their business processes, management must take a systematic approach to identifying and resolving process constraints. These constraints are the bottlenecks or limiting factors that prevent the system from achieving its objective. In order to improve the overall performance and efficiency of the system, it is crucial for management to prioritize these process constraints and address them first. As the nature of these constraints may evolve over time, it is essential that management continue to use a systematic approach to identify and address newly emerging constraints. The five steps that make up the systematic approach to continuous improvement are as follows. 1. Identify the system's constraint. 2. Decide how to exploit the system's constraint. 3. Subordinate everything else to the above decision. 4. Elevate the system constraint. 5. Don't allow inertia to cause a system's constraint. Thinking processes are required to enable the manager to carry out each step of the continuous improvement strategy. The thought process begins by viewing all actions in a business as links in a chain. As the chain's strength is determined by its weakest link, the first step in improving a business is to identify its weakest link or constraint. The first thought process should result in a response to the question what to change. The second thought process should result in an answer to the question what to change at T. The third thinking process should result in a response to the question how to cause the change. Essentially, these are the most fundamental abilities a manager should possess. To summarize these points, every action that brings a company closer to its goal is productive, whereas every action that does not bring the company closer to its goal is unproductive. This led us to the conclusion that productivity cannot be measured without a goal. According to the metrics identified in the book, a company's goal is to improve throughput while simultaneously decreasing inventory and operational costs. The constant application of these metrics will balance the flow of work with the market demand. To improve the flow of work it is important that a bottleneck resource is distinguished from non-bottleneck resources. The business's effective capacity is determined by the bottleneck resource. Expanding only the bottlenecks is required to increase the business capacity to meet market demand. As one bottleneck is alleviated, a second bottleneck will emerge. It is essential that management be constantly engaged in enhancing business processes. To achieve this, management must systematically identify and eliminate process constraints, as outlined in the five-step approach. As management works methodically through the five-step process, a thinking process is required to answer the following question. What should be changed? What should it be changed to? How should the change be implemented? This methodical and reflective process is the core of every manager's duties.